My castaway this week is an entertainer. Born in Liverpool and brought up in a strict Catholic family, he first came to fame in the 60s as an anarchic disc jockey on pirate radio. Sacked for making offensive jokes, he moved to the BBC, where his humour resulted in the same fate. His personality, however, proved irrepressible. He went on to establish a huge following on Capital Radio and on television, where he had his own show during the 80s. His unorthodox style mirrors his life. He's taken drugs, attempted suicide, and after the breakup of his 12 year old marriage, he came out as a homosexual. Earlier this year, he revealed he'd been diagnosed as having the AIDS virus. He faces the possibility of death philosophically. My sense of humour, he says, will probably be the last thing to go. He is Kenny Everett. In fact, Kenny, you've known you were HIV positive for some years, haven't you? Yes, about four years. So why did you suddenly decide to go public on it? Hello, by the way. <laughs> Uh, well, I didn't decide to. I came back from a little holiday in Italy and uh, there was a bunch of press people waiting with microphones and cameras. And it turns out that I'd been spotted going into hospital by a, a press cameraman. And he just took lots of photographs of me walking in the rain with an umbrella and no beard. I'd take my beard off. I was walking into the hospital looking a little annoyed about the rain. So they took this picture from behind a tree of me looking a little annoyed. And the next day, there in the front page of the pe People, a huge colour photograph of me looking annoyed. And the line was, The photograph that shows how ill he really is. And I wasn't looking ill at all. As you can see, I look lovely. I mean, you feel perfectly oh, I healthy. I feel fabulous, yes. I haven't gone on to get the full thing yet, mm. but, uh, you know, mm. I feel great. So you go to hospital for regular checks? About once every six months, and they say, your blood is bouncing, dear. Mm. But the thing is about that, I mean, in the end, you held a kind of impromptu press conference, didn't you? In the street, you? In yes. The street. Uh, you ended up making a lot of jokes about it and making even the hardened old journalists laugh about it. I mean, that was quite, quite a feat. Well, I can't see there's any point in depressing anyone, can you? Well, I mean, my, my, my views on the next life is it's probably going to be fab, the next one. I, I've got this th theory that we are in an endless loop of lives and it just never ends. But, I mean, is there a darker side? Do you worry every time you go well, to every a time, Every now and then I sort of think about the absolute end of everything and that gets me for about a second and then I say, stop it, you know, and think about something jolly because there's no point in ponderising on... I mean, I could get run over by a truck tomorrow. Mm. So could you, Sue. Mm. What's the point of thinking about it? Well, it's just that perhaps it presses upon you a bit more. If you suddenly get a cold and you can't shake it off or something, you might think, is this the beginning of, of full-blown AIDS? Well, I think if I got a cold and it wouldn't go away, I think I would think, dear God, just please make it fast. Mm. I think it's the, the lingering that... Uh, goes with this is the, is the awful bit. And what about music in all of this? Does it, is it a comfort you spent again a lifetime in pop? Do you sort of <laughs> lean back into music sometimes when you're feeling... Oh, yes, uh, it, it's a tonic. It's a tonic, so, you know, I love music. I, I, in fact, when I discovered classical music, it was just like a whole fresh new life for me. Classical music? Oh, yes, I discovered classical music when I was about seven. There was a, a, a junk shop next to the school called Rosie's. And uh, she used to have, God knows where she got them from, she had new 78s, big 12-inch classical 78s, and they were only threepence. So I used to get one every day on my way home from school, and uh, I had a kiddie gram, you know, those plastic things that you play nursery rhymes on. Mm. So I wrenched the horn off so I could throw away the kiddie record, because I'd heard Mary got a little lamb, it's boring, isn't it? So I put these big records on and used to turn it around with my finger at approximately 78 and put the needle and the horn on the edge and just work my way inward. It was all wrong, there's tons of wow and horror, but, but at least it was music in my bedroom. So you've got classics as well as pop in your desert island overnight bag, have you? Well, Rosie didn't have any pop. <laughs> she only had classics, so that was my introduction to music. And I, the first one I picked up was a nice, simple English piece by a man called George Butterworth, and it was a big 78 called The Banks of Green Willow, and that was my introduction to classical music. Sweet thing. George Butterworth's The Banks of Green Willow, played by the Academy of St Martin in the Fields, conducted by Neville Mariner. So how, Kenny Everett, did a, a weedy wimp from Liverpool... A oh, thank you very much. This is your phrase. <laughs> a pogo stick with hair. Well, I didn't think that up. That's definitely yours. How did you get into radio in, in the 60s? I mean, did you just write off and ask for your own programme? 
Um, well, I've always been a huge fan of radio. I used to listen to what was called the home service in those days. I used to listen to right up until the end, because that's when the announcer used to get intimate. When he thought the director general wasn't listening, because he was tucked up in bed, he'd sort of ad lib and say, well, I can see the, the gas lamps flickering in Portland Place. It's time to wrap up for the night. And he'd have a little chat with the listener. And I always used to stay up for that, because it's, it sounded quite cosy. So I always wanted to be a, a, a DJ. Because you were quite a kind of mechanical wizard. You were putting together tapes and things in your bedroom, weren't you? Yes, I had a paper round. And with the proceeds, I bought two tape machines. I used to make silly programmes for my friends. And you wired up the house with loudspeakers and pretended to be the radio to your mum? Yes, I banned her from listening to the BBC. She had to listen to my channel. I only had an audience of two. And Still the... have, actually. <laughs> so... So you made up a programme. You were called... You, you weren't Kenny Everett then, of course, were you? No, I was christened Morris Cole, which is a very odd thing to call a child. Is it? Especially in Liverpool, yes. Morris, Morris Cole. Cole. My grandfather was Morris, you see. Hmm. But they decided to be posh in my case, and the French M-A-U-R-I-C-E hmm. has a little poshness. As in Maurice my, Chevalier. Yeah, yes, because uh, my mother... The worst thing my mother could think of to say about anybody was that they were common. So, so she, she called me Maurice. <laughs> I thought it was a hideous name. So, so you put together it. this show called the Morris Cole Quarter of an Hour Show. Which lasted about 12 minutes. And sent it to the BBC. Yes, because a, a friend of mine said, why, why are you sending us this show, this silly, lovely but silly show, when you could be making money out of it? Why didn't you send it to the Beeb? So I made a tape up and sent it to a programme called Midweek. And they sent me a telegram back saying, Darling! Come immediately. It's wonderful. But it didn't work. You didn't get the job. I did the interview, and I said, uh, "Wow, you've got carpets that go right to the edge. I want, to, I want to work here." And they said, "Well, we haven't got any jobs at the moment because there's Pete Murray and David Jacobs, and that's all we need, really." But you ended up in pirate radio instead, not the BBC. That's right. Well, I sent the same tape to the pirates because the producer at the BBC said, oh, well, we haven't got any room, actually. Why don't you try one of these pirate johnnies that have just sailed in? And I found out where they were and sent them the same tape, and they said, we're desperate for DJs, come on board immediately. So the next day, there I was in Frinton Railway Station with my bag full of hankies and wife runts and toothpaste off on board this tub. And you ended up there bobbing about Watching the lights of Frinton, feeling very ill. Very, very ill, yes. We had about three months to get our sea legs. And I remember the lights of Frinton going from side to side and me leaning over the edge thinking, I'd give my legs to be in Frinton. <laughs> but uh, we couldn't get to Frinton because there was a three-month-long storm, so I had to get used to it. But what makes it a very good story is that, you know, you were funny, you were original, you were Liverpudlian, it was the 60s, you were in pirate radio. I mean, you were the right man in the right place at the right time, weren't you? Yes, it was a bit of luck. There was Carnaby Street, the Beatles, there was uh, being Liverpudlian and helped, of course, pirate radio. It all seemed to come together. It was a mini renaissance Sue. Record number two, Ken. Well, there I was, bouncing around in the North Sea, and we got a little tug that used to come out and deliver records and water and food and things. One day, out came... Brian Epstein's personal assistant with a freshly minted copy of Strawberry Fields Forever, Stroke Penny Lane. And I was on the air at the time, and because Brian Epstein liked the pirates so much, uh, he just gave it to me to play, and I was the first person in the world to play this glorious record. The Beatles and Strawberry Fields Forever. Let's go back to you as a kid on Merseyside. Reading about it, it doesn't sound too happy. You were fairly solitary and your parents were pretty uncommunicative. Well, I, was all, I, I always thought that Liverpool was a bit grey. Even when I first came out, I mean, of my mum, <laughs> I thought, oh, heck, this isn't very nice. Because it was kind of industrial and... You lived people, in a pretty mm. grotty part, didn't you? Yes, we had a garden about the size of your nose. It was just the smallest piece of grass you've ever seen. <laughs> And people want to thump you. They did in the 40s. They just, you know, you walk into a bar and you look at somebody for more than a split second and you say, what the bloody hell are you looking at? And before you know it, your face is all over the floor. Mm. They're kind of aggressive. I think it comes from doing dock work and things. Your dad was a it's tugboat kinda, driver. Oh, yeah, he was, he was quite romantic, actually. He was a tugboat captain. You were shy and, uh, and spindly and 
worried a lot of the time. Were you mm, totally neurotic. Worried about being bullied. Everything. And how, how, if there was a God, why did he make me so thin and spindly? And you were terrified of God. Yes, well, I was brought up a Catholic in the true, you know, if you, if you do something slightly naughty, you go to purgatory for an awful long time, and it's really awful. It's really bad. But if you commit one of these list of sins uh, and you don't get the confession in time, you'll go to hell forever, and hell is unimaginable agony forever. Fancy telling that to a kid? It's so outrageous. What, what effect did it have on you? Well, it made me terrified, of course. <laughs> it, it also made me behave for a while until I figured out that the, uh, the Catholic Church was a business and a very clever one. I wish I'd thought of it. Has it stayed with you, that sort of feeling? What, terror? Hmm. No, no, I'm absolutely happy now. Completely happy. So what made life worth living at this time? I mean, what were the treats? Because it all sounds a bit... <clears throat> Music, I think. Up in my bedroom with my kiddie gram. And the radio. Well, that, that, that did it for me, yes. And the, oh, and the, the wireless. Don't yeah. call it radio. It's just nouveau stuff. It's <laughs> wireless. <laughs> I used to love listening to the announcers. They were so friendly. And they didn't say, you know, what a bloody hell are you looking at? They used to say, hello. What a lovely record this is. They used to actually talk like, like nice people. So I thought that was very appealing. Next record. I think one of the great thrills of life is being in bed generally. But in the old days it was even more of a thrill because the surroundings were not quite as fabulous as they are now. Um, so I used to <laughs> look forward to going to bed madly, unlike most kids. I used to go to bed with my little Philips transistor radio, which had just appeared then, transistors. And it was a little Philips red plastic thing with a little grating on the front. And I used to take it to bed with me and listen to Radio Luxembourg. At the end of the broadcasts, after David Jacobs had finished playing Da Do Ron Ron or whatever, they used to have this glorious piece of music to finish off the day's broadcasting. And it was an English guy called Steve Conway with a very simple, beautiful tune called At the End of the Day with a choir and everything. It was just, it was like, it was like Ovaltine for your ears. It was such a lovely tune to end the day. Steve Conway, At the End of the Day. So you escaped from Liverpool into pirate radio, as we've heard, and, and then you developed a talent for getting sacked. Um, you rubbished the sponsors, first of all, on commercial radio, the advertisers, didn't you? Yes, I used to have a six till nine show in the evenings... And they used to interrupt it every night with this taped thing from America from a man called Garner Ted Armstrong. And he used to have a show called The World Tomorrow. And it was half an hour on tape sent to radio stations all around the world where you get the programme and he pays you like £50 pounds a night to broadcast it. And it's an evangelical thing. And he tells you what horrors are in store on this planet if you don't buy his magazine. So I used to think this was a huge interruption in my show. A, I didn't agree what he, with what he said, because I'm quite an optimist, really. He was fire and brimstone all over the place. So I used to disagree with what he said and think, why me? Why has it been plonked in the middle of my show? Everybody's going to turn off, because they don't want to hear depressing things. So when, when, at the end of the show, I used to say sort of little, snide little comments about him, and um, one day he came to England on a little tourette, and I didn't know he was there. And I said one of my funny little things at the end of his show, and he rang Radio London and said, get that shit off my show. <laughs> and I thought, hello. <laughs> and it was like a question of whether the radio station thought it was worth getting rid of me and keeping the 50 pounds a night, or vice versa, and they chose the 50 pounds a night. Uh -huh. That was my first introduction to commercial thinking. Then you went to the BBC to get away from all of that, but then you got sacked twice over the years from there, once for insulting the Minister of Transport's wife. Well, it wasn't really an insult. It was just people were so touchy in those days, oh. you know. I mean, nowadays you can get away with anything because the BBC softened up and people have become more outrageous. Well, you told quite a dirty joke about Mrs Thatcher when you got sacked the second time, which you needn't repeat now. Yeah, no, I won't repeat it because I've forgotten it. <laughs> but uh, that was handed to me on a piece of paper at about one minute before the end of the show by my producer. He said, oh, here's a funny way to end the show. And he gave it to me, and I thought, well, there's only 30 seconds to go. I'll just read it, because, you know, I mean, he's a BBC producer. I'll so you didn't know him. what you were saying? No, and I just read this thing. I got to the last line, which was a hugely heinous insult to Margaret Thatcher, and uh, thought, oh, well. But did the adrenaline pump when you knew you were going to say or do something that was a bit risque? Oh, yes, yes. I mean, when, you, when you're going to say something slightly naughty, you, uh, half of your brain is saying, don't do it. 
and the other half saying, oh, but I'll get noticed, and then I might get a few job offers, you know, because I'm bound to get fired. In fact, the first time I got fired from the BBC, the man rang me up, the general director of programmes or something, and he said, Kinney, it's time for the parting of the ways. <laughs> and I said, oh, all right, cheerio, um, <laughs> because I'd just got a contract from London Weekend Television that very day saying, why don't you come and do a huge series of television programmes for us? So, you see, one thing leads to another. Amazing, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Let's have your next record. Number four, is it? Number four. Well, uh, on commercial radio, I started doing a silly space serial because I've always, since the days of Eagle Annual and Dan Dare, Pilot of the Future, I've always been a huge space fan. So I used to make this silly serial in my Cotswold home studio. The night before I went on the air, which is Friday night, I used to think up a lot of silly space gags, stitch them together into a script, and then go to bed. Next morning at 7 o'clock, I would get up, go into the studio with a cup of coffee, do all the voices, put music on, uh, edit it together, and put it onto a tape. Jump in the car at about 10 o'clock and drive hell for leather to London, to the radio station, and then stick it in the hole in the machine and say, hello, folks, it's 12 o'clock, and press the button. And I'd just done it, so it was nice and fresh, and I'd actually sit there and laugh at it, because I hadn't heard the jokes before, because I'd only just done them. It was all fresh and laugh like the greatest story in the universe. Kremen of the Star Corps. In today's nerve-noggling episode, you'll hear the following fabulous stars. Val Duree, Nelly There, and Doug Allerange. Here's Kremen. Hey! Friends, thank you, friends, and hi, kids. You remember in our last wondrous episode how we'd landed on a far-off world in search of fuel, only to find that the whole planet was made of a strange, sticky goo. The doc had jumped in to find out what it was made of and immediately sank up to his ears. Oh, Captain, what are we gonna do? Don't worry. I'll climb down and pull him out. You hold on to the doorknob and I'll hold on to you. That way we may be able to reach him. I wrenched off my space tunic. <laughs> Captain, what? What's that scar on your shoulder? What? Oh, that. Oh, I got that months ago in a car accident. Really? Hmm. I wrapped my car around a tree and was trapped in it for ages. Oh, golly. What happened? Well, thank heavens, two cars happened along and saw my plight. Who was in the cars? Mr. and Mrs. Smith and Mr. and Mrs. Ball. Fortunately, I was pulled out by the Smiths. <laughs> what will happen next? <laughs> Tune in tomorrow at the same time and find out in Cramon of the Star Corps. Kenny Everett and the adventures of Captain Cremon. So by the early 70s, Kenny Everett, you were very famous. People thought you were zany, mischievous, unpredictable. Wacky is usually wacky, the one. Anarchic, <laughs> outrageous. What they never suspected was that you were suicidal. Only for a short time. I mean, there are depressing moments in life where you think, oh, God, it's just too much. I really felt silly about that. What were the circumstances that had made you do it, then? I fell in love with somebody that wasn't in love with me. You know that one, Sue. But, <laughs> but was this, by this stage, a man that you'd fallen in love with? Yes, was it was. It, it was your mm. homosexuality and coming out? Yes, it? yes. It was, it, it, was, it was quite upsetting, really, because I didn't know how to approach people, having a sort of solitary life up to then. So, I mean, the last thing you do when you fancy somebody is go up to them and say... I really love you, should we go off together? Because, you know, you tend to get a bunch of fives or a definite no. And I got the definite no. But also, uh, presumably, it was upsetting because it, it, it had come at the end of 12 years or more, during which time you'd been married, perhaps trying to pretend to yourself that you weren't homosexual. I keep saying homosexual because you don't like the word gay, do you? Well, gay to me means happy and jolly. Yeah. I still think of the old-fashioned connotation of that yeah. word. But you'd been trying to suppress your homosexual tendencies. Well, not suppress it. Um, I thought maybe if I married this jolly lady, who I, with whom I was great friends, I thought maybe one day I'd wake up and look at her and, and it would snap and I'd think, oh, I get it. You know, the shape and the lumps and the softness and everything, and I, suddenly it would all fall into place. But I realised a lot later that uh, you're, you are what you're born. If you're born gay, then you're gay forever. But when you were first coming to terms with all of that, what were you feeling? Were you feeling shame or fear? Or... Well, yes, because I'd been brought up to think that it was a huge sin. 
I thought, I'm going to go to hell forever. What about your parents? What did they think? Perhaps you were frightened of what they would think, were you? Oh, absolutely, yes. They were very... They didn't know how to handle gayness, because gayness in those days was something very odd. And uh, you just sort of... If your son was gay, you just didn't talk about it. But how, how did they react at the time, and how have they reacted since? Well, apparently at a party, a friend of mine told my father, oh, that's Everett's new boyfriend. And he said, oh, well, if that's what he wants to be, that's all right. Mm. Wish he'd said that 20 years earlier. Mm. Wish I'd asked him, actually. Plus, he was a tugboat captain. I mean, you can't waltz up to your father and say, Dad, I know you're a great chunk, but I, you know, I want to be in showbiz and do silly things, and I'm, by the way, I'm gay. I think he might have killed me. <laughs> Next piece of music. Well, Sue, I'd have to take a, a pop record with me, in amongst all this classic, heart-rending stuff, because... Uh, I've been playing pop records now since I first joined radio, which is 25 years ago. And I think the most consummate pop record I've ever heard, and a record that started me into my career as a dancer, was ABBA's Honey Honey. Honey Honey. ABBA and Honey Honey. You hit television in the 80s, the Kenny Everett video show, and again you created a zany, fantastic world. It became hugely popular. And then one day in the late 80s you called the whole thing off. You turned away. It lacked dignity, you said. What did you mean by that? I probably meant it's too uncomfortable because uh, the last sketch I, I did for the BBC was the most uncomfortable I've ever been in my life. There I was doing a sketch with Cleo, my busty friend on television. We used to do sketches together. We were wearing harnesses, and you know they go to parts, the unmentionable parts, they hoist you up into the air, dressed as Quasimodo. I was Quasimodo, she was Esmeralda. I was dressed in sackcloth, which is extremely uncomfortable. I had an eye blanked out and a glass eye somewhere here on my cheek, a horrible, uncomfortable woolly wig, and tons of makeup. And she also was uh, dressed similarly uncomfortably. And with the harness around your parts hoisted up into the lights doing the, oh, the bells, the bells sketch, we were hoisted up with these four million kilowatt lights and our camera went wrong. And they decided that it would be less expensive to leave us up there while they fixed the camera. So there we were, slowly rotating in amongst these frying lights, dressed from head to foot in sackcloth, and when we both sort of came twirling round to each other, I said to Cleo, that's it. I've done now. I've done every possible computation of funny sketch. It's too uncomfortable. And when I came to sign the next contract, Quasimodo came through from my subconscious and said, don't do it. Really? Radio's much more comfortable, isn't it, Sue? Yeah. I mean, you don't have to wear half as much makeup. It's also, it's also quite a solitary pursuit, which is what you've always said you are, really, quite a, a solitary person. Mm. I think I spent so much time talking to myself in Liverpool that uh, I've probably developed a line of patter. And I never disagree with myself. So... And I'm always there when I need me. <laughs> <laughs> so why should a man who's basically as we say, solitary and shy and all those things, end up starring in a West End musical a couple of years ago and, um, and you can answer that and tell me about your sixth record at the same time. <laughs> OK. <laughs> <laughs> well, hmm. I got rung up by Mike Batt, who is a musical genius, and he said, I've, uh, I've got this wonderful West End thing I'm going to put on, five and a half million pounds, a 32-piece orchestra on stage. Would you come and sing and dance and juggle and do funny lines? And I th said, no, absolutely not. I'd really rather stay at home because the bother and the nerves would be humongous. And then he kept ringing and ringing and saying, oh, well, you'd only have a few lines. You know, you just have to come on, huge applause, wallop, line, off. So I said, oh, all right then. So the name went into the, the ads and everything and he started giving me more and more lines, more and more steps. The whole... Th played two and a half hours. I was on stage for the whole two and a half hours, twirling and dancing, having to remember where I stand, having to remember lines. It was a nightmare. But I thought to myself a couple of weeks before we actually went on, this is the most important thing you've ever done. You know, if you, if you forget your lines or you land in the wrong place and fall over a dancer or bump into something, the orchestra will have to stop we will have to start again. It'll be a nightmare. You've got to get it right. You've just got to concentrate. And I did. I, I told myself to behave, and I got it right. I remembered all the lines. I twirled in the right places. 
the opening night was such a success. It really was. It was huge. I brought my mum and dad over from Australia, where they live. First class jumbo. There, there went my profits from Hunting of the Snark. And all my friends were there. It was a huge success. I, I really enjoyed the opening night. And that's the only thing I did it for, that I could say that I'd done a West End musical spectacular. The title track from Mike Batts' The Hunting of the Snark. You live on your own, you're impeccably tidy, you even hoover the plastic grass on the balcony, it says in the cutting. Not only that, Sue, mm. I found myself going a little too far a few weeks ago, I found myself polishing the hoover. <laughs> it's got to stop. <laughs> so the desert island would be a doddle, you'd sort of clean it up and make it all cosy, would you? Uh, well, I wouldn't arrange the sand. I mean, <laughs> I'd probably dredge it every now and then clear away the old insects. But I don't like sand, actually. I, I, I'd like the island carpeted, if you could manage that. Right to the edge. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and now you're in your philosophical phase, as you said. Perhaps the whole business of being quite alone on a desert island would be a, a cinch, really. Oh, yes, yes. I had a huge practice at it, yeah. I love it. I love being on my own. Some people I talk to say in the end they couldn't bear being on their own, on the desert island, as it were, that, that, that they would eventually resort to suicide. Um, oh, I've done that one. Well, quite. Done that. <laughs> Been there. <laughs> but do you think you would in the end, or, or perhaps do you know from experience that you simply wouldn't? I think I could probably do a huge while of being on my own. But then when I've heard all my jokes and my lines, I think I might resort to making a raft. And your, your sense of humour would stay with you to the end, would it? Oh, I think so, yes. It's, I mean, life is funny. It's odd. It's a, it's, a, it's a rather amusing joke, really. I mean, there are parts of life that you think are absolutely not funny, like war and being poor and hungry. That's not funny at all, but... You, c you can't spend all your time thinking, oh, God, it must be awful to be hungry. you just got to get on with it and make it as much fun for yourself and other people as possible. Record number seven. Well, Beatles are quite a huge part of my life because uh, in 1966 I was requested by the pirate radio station I worked for to, would I please go to America for the first time for uh, about three weeks following the Beatles around recording comments and little interviews with them from town to town. We did 31 towns in 32 days, <laughs> loads of concerts. It was a huge thrill, and we became good friends because we, we were all from Liverpool, so we knew what was what and uh, had the same silly accent. So the Beatles would have to be on my desert island with me. And we've already done Strawberry Fields Forever, so I think my next favourite would have to be Sgt Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Was, uh, I was invited to hear it by George Harrison in his house one day when they'd just made it. And he sat me down in front of the speakers and said, what do you think of this, Ken? Put the needle on the acetate. And I just was blown into the wall by this gorgeous music. He said, do you think we ought to release it, Ken? <laughs> I said, yes, I think you ought to, George. Beatles and Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club band. What would you change, Kenny, if you could have your life all over again? Oh, nothing really. I think it's been all right, really. I mean, je ne regret rien. I mean, I think it's all right. Even the gay bit. I think that that that's been very interesting too. Uh, despite the the paranoia attached to it, like I think I'm going to be bashed up in the street any moment, or used to think that. But uh, an interesting thing, my straight black masseur told me one day, because uh, we've been great chums, and he comes and gives... It, I love being masseured. It's like exercise without moving. It's so great. And uh, when I came out in the press, or when the press dragged me out and I was front page for just being gay, he said, now you know what it's like being black. Because I told him I'd been bothered in the street by workmen taking their trousers off <laughs> on the scaffolding. <laughs> Uh, he said, now you know what it's like to be black. You just get picked on. If people have got spare hatred, they just, you know, oh, what's unusual about him? Oh, he's got a funny nose. Let's be beat him up. Oh, he's gay. Oh, he's Jewish. Oh, he's black. It's the same thing. It's just a receptacle for people's spare hatred. But I've enjoyed it. I like gay people. I think they're fun. Last record. Well, I've chosen Puccini's Symphonic Prelude because it's just the most beautiful record I've ever heard. Um, if I ever do die, um, I think as I'm hoiked aloft in a, a ray of God's lovely sunbeam. I think I'd like this to be on the gramophone as I go. 
part of Puccini's symphonic prelude played by the Radio Symphony Orchestra of Berlin, conducted by Ricardo Chailly. It's a beautiful piece of music, but I thought you had every intention of dying laughing. Hmm. Well, I think I'd like to die serene. I haven't been very serene in this life. It's been a sort of a turmoilish sort of life, going on in front of cameras and being silly and potty. I think I'd like to try a bit of serenity. And if you could only take one of those eight records with you? It would have to be the Puccini, I think, because just, it's just beautiful. It's, yes. it's a beauty. It's just liquid loveliness. Mm. The others are memories, good, jolly memories, but the Puccini is just, it's God. It's God with knobs on. <laughs> and your book? Well, I, I'm going to be on this desert island for a while, I guess, yes. So I need uh, intellectual stimulation, I think, because I've heard all my lines. So I think I'll go for Eagle Annual. And your luxury? It'll have to be a bathroom suite, because I don't want to be dirty on my desert island. I feel very uncomfortable if, I'm, if I don't wash for at least a day. So I'll have to have a hot shower, limitless hot water, and a lifetime supply of Badidas Su. It shall be done. Thank you. Kenny Everett, thank you very much indeed for letting us hear your Desert Island Discs. Thank you. It's been huge fun.